So we're just waiting for everyone to join um, and we'll introduce in a few minutes. Um, but we call our panelists waiting to present to everybody. Um, and it's really great to have everybody joining us this afternoon. It always looks very sunny at, at Drawing Projects UK. You always give this impression of... <laughs> of sunny. Always sunny at Drawing Projects UK. Um, we had some uh, some people through in the, in the show who took some photographs of how much light there is in the building. Um, it's a building in Wiltshire, for those of you joining us for the first time, which was built in the 1920s, so between the wars, and it's really designed to make as much light in the space um, as it possibly can. It's a very beautiful space to see drawing. Hmm. So everybody's just gathering with 60 people in the audience so far and we've now already started the slide so I think we should start because I'm not sure I can pause my presentation. Shall I download and start again? Yeah, I think I think we should uh, start again. Start again to have that first slide just so we can you just get my desktop for a moment. Are we there. Brilliant. So we have five minutes while everybody gathers um, because we know that people are joining us from all over the world this afternoon. I'm Anita Taylor. I'm the, I'm all sorts of things. Um, I'm the founder of Drawing Projects UK. I'm the founder of the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize. I'm also the Dean of Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee. Um, but we're here this afternoon because during the Wharf Drawing Prize exhibition for 2020, we have uh, support from Arts Council England in order to present the exhibition here physically, but also to run an online engagement programme. And we're incredibly thrilled to have Chloe Briggs, as also known as Drawing is Free, working with us as an online artist in residence. And that means that we've been watching a fantastic programme uh, develop with Chloe leading that uh, to engage with people across the world and to enthuse them and generate ideas in and through drawing. The format, Chloe is going to tell us a little bit about the format in a moment, but if I can ask everybody on the panel and anyone else to make sure microphones are muted and cameras are turned off unless you're speaking, there is a Q&A function so that people can ask questions which we'll take at the end, but Chloe will talk us through the format in a moment, but it's a very warm welcome to Drawing Projects UK in the virtual world, and it's a very warm welcome to Chloe Briggs, who's going to talk us through the format for the session, and then she, while we're on this slide, and then the next slide, she will introduce the first speaker, so thank you. Hello everybody. Um, I think the invitation has been amazing to run this virtual residence. Um, I've just seen it as an opportunity to learn um, in all kinds of ways and not least today. I think this is probably the most ambitious event that we've put in place. Um, so many people involved um, from all over the world. Um, people sharing um, their, their passion for teaching drawing. Um, and I just wanted to say a little bit about the format and the kind of virtual space, because for me, as for most of us, you know, our, our physical realities, points of connection um, in our daily lives is, is limited, is increasingly limited. Um, in Paris this evening, we're, um, we're going to start a curfew for six weeks. Um, but for me, this virtual space has been um, proving to be an incredibly vital tool um, for opening my world up and um, the connections I've made so far um, with this opportunity have been amazing. So thank you to everyone joining us. Um, I think it's going to activate in a second our slideshow. So it will it will run, um, the Petra Kucha format is um, 20 slides, 20 second per slide. It's an incredibly visual way to, um, to experience a presentation. Um, and what will happen in between when the, when the, the speaker has finished, um, I'll introduce the next one. So it'll be a short introduction for me, from me. 
Uh, we're going to have a pause uh, after Kelly Shorpening's presentation. So after six presentations, we'll have 10 minutes uh, for people to go and, um, and walk around, get away from the screen for a minute. Um, and if we ask you to just stay online with us during that time, keep muted and, uh, and all that. So we'll, we'll start then 10 minutes promptly. Um, we'll have five more presentations. And then at the end, we'll have 15 minutes for questions and answers and drawing projects are, are um, basically steering this whole thing. <laughs> so it's very nice for me. I can, I can just talk and listen and not have to operate the, the controls. Um, okay, Anita, do you, are you almost there? We have people gathering. I think we've got 52 uh, in the audience at the moment, so we're expecting a few more. But okay. I think the slide should just roll through in a moment, so we're just waiting for the slide to roll through. And if there's anything wrong with that, then we'll jump in. <laughs> Five minutes seems like a long time, doesn't it? <laughs> I know. I thought, I mean, I, I was I was ready to talk <laughs> for a long time there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. So the first speaker is Leticia Legros, who uh, teaches at the Ecole Supérieure d'Art de Calais in Dun on the Dunkirk site in France. So in a few seconds, it will be over to you, Leticia, to talk us through. Uh, yes, thanks, Chloe, for your introduction and for choosing uh, my proposition. Under this title, Drawing Space, I will present various ways to think and define drawing, being attentive to relationship, to spaces, gestures, and variations, from conceptual drawing to forms of narration, uh, I present some references I use to introduce some subjects like exhibitor line or drawing room. Here I begin with the Duchamp stoppage uh, to introduce drawing as a concept, but also an experience that involves variations. Uh, Tom Marioni, One Minute Sculpture, uh, is a photography capturing a free gesture. Drawing is to spend in this space, like another form of hazard, that focus an instant. Uh, and Richard Turtle uh, play um, with the drawing process itself, since uh, each segment of string depends on a choreography, considering gestures on their memory, but also body dimensions. Here, um, an image, another line drawn by a man walking, going away from the camera, a motion analysis by Marais, by means um, of a bright spot located on the lumbar of the subject. So line is um, here a moving point from a three-dimensional space to a two-dimensional writing. Here is another costume designed by Mare for a chronophotographic study of the motion, uh, this time uh, by means of lines and points marking joints. This scientific image is a, has deep meaning as introducing various contemporary experiences in art from choreography to modeling tools or performance. Uh, a body sculpture and performance by Rebecca Aaron, uh, like an invisible line made by walking, which could be an echo to the Richard Long line uh, three, three years uh, earlier. He has Matisse a drawing realized uh, using a stick, a long stick uh, on the ceiling. Uh, this image is, uh, is relative to a subject drawing room. Uh, so here is a cabinet of curiosity uh, because some, sometimes the artist is also a kind of collector. 
uh, style a still of the film uh, Felix in Exile by Kent Ridge about drawing on paper and deployment of drawing on wall, depending to personal, logical, and intentions. Also interesting about the context of the work. Here is uh, Sylvia Buckley about uh, relationship uh, with drawing room. Uh, I often refer to, uh, to this artist through, through uh, visuals. This one, which present earlier drawings, uh, and this one, a view of uh, her studio. Studio also has a room to see, to think, to organize thinking uh, on drawing by various scales and working. And uh, then uh, the next view of Sylvia Buckley is a view of her exhibition in the Nice Biennale in uh, 2009. It's a spacious and airy scenography in accordance with drawings that become um, more and more clear. She seems to play with silences to grow uh, on evol evolving uh, lines. I come back to Matisse with theme and variations. Uh, invite us to observation, but also to repeat the act of drawing. Uh, variations could evolve towards seriality or animation for students. Uh, I, I'm also in the transition with the third part of my presentation about relationship and influences between drawing, photography, and prints with Artung here, uh, which is playing uh, with a process li leaving trace uh, in the print. Here is the Geometria by Cornelis Scott, uh, an invitation to travel by uh, the extension to the subject by detail and perspective, but also a composition that is featuring various points of views on measuring instrument. Uh, Lee Freelander, photographer whose practice uh, goes through a graphic sensibility. Here it's question about persistence of geometry in photography. Uh, with this view, we can uh, discover also Aurélie Nemours in the center, rhythm of millimeter, like a vertical window in tandem with the um, different lenders photography. And on the right, a photography by Dear Breckman is opening the perspective uh, on question questioning the distance to a quotidian scene. And I finish with Richard Serra, uh, a lithography uh, that, is a, 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 that is a drawing, cutting in black a plan with a lithographic chalk. Uh, by this opaque form, he, uh, he opens the space. So uh, the last view from Artung to Richard Serra are part of a current exhibition I curated, Apparatus, from which uh, I will work this semester with students questioning and experimenting perception approach by drawing. Thanks for your attention. I'm sorry for my English, uh, not fluent. Merci, Laetitia. I have to be faster to get in the next person. Thank you very much. Jo Lewis is next, who's a London-based artist. And for over 20 years, she's combined her own practice with teaching. Over to you, Jo. Um, hello, everybody. Well, I'm starting with this image um, because I think this little man epitomizes something that um, I once read about drawing. Start boldly and finish carefully. And here he is on the left, getting on with it, total physical immersion. And on the right, he sits back and a conversation is starting. So can I teach about this energy and joy of line? On the left, we've got Leonardo's Madonna and Child with Cat, amazing energy of line in carving out of space that I also see in Will Allsop's Scribble Sculpture at Goldsmiths in London. And if I'm talking about the primacy of line, I might look at Agnes Martin's last known drawing on the left and on the right, Rembrandt's Sleeping Woman. Every line is essential, each one vital to the drawing and portrayal of space.
And how can I teach about drawing as a way we constantly navigate our relationship with the world around us, whether or not those drawings are totally ephemeral? On the left is one of Leila Curtis's message in a bottle GPS drawings. And on the right, two recent walks of my own. And I, I love the fact that it all ties together with these red lines. Now this little girl is actually sitting in front of a mirror and the project was to do a self portrait. But the drawing for her has quite naturally become an extension of herself and the two are one. And in the same way on the right with this Zaha Hadid sketch, if you look at the line of the landscape at the bottom, the drawing starts with that line and seamlessly goes into the imagined space of her design. So how can we increase our awareness of our bodies in drawing? Rebecca Horn has accepted that her body is limited and has found ways of extending into space. And in doing this, the image of her with her extensions is as powerful as the drawings she creates. Um, here, London Film School students are drawing with rope to inspire a new project. They're using lines of rope to connect and draw in and with space. A new line of our inquiry is articulated and explored. And then they made short um, films on their phones uh, of their drawings in the landscape. On the left is a drawing by Tiepolo, two female figures. The lines aren't static, it, they dance, it breaks and the drawing literally breathes. And on the right is a sculpture of barbed wire I saw in a local gallery, actually no idea who did it. And the shadow it cast creates the same strong dancing animate line. But can we let drawing surprise us? In Raphael's drawing, there's hardly any body apart from these disjointed hands. And on the right, these two students become a double-headed life model, exploring the concept of being the model and the artist. Can I encourage students to explore and push the limits of the materials they're using? Can they get to know it experiment? On the left, first year architecture students at the Bartlett are stretching in, in as many ways as they can to describe the city and on the right is Rembrandt's seated man, showing the artist totally at one with their medium. Can I teach students to be the brush, the pencil, the pen, not the artist? On the left is work by Yang Yang Wen, using ink in a myriad of different ways. And on the right, Sylvia Backley's untitled drawing shows this incredible subtlety and control. These photos are from a project with a group of screenwriters. We know the tree on the left offers an infinite possibility of response, but we also know that everything doesn't need to be shown to capture it. Can I teach the students to be selective, to focus, to edit and play? On the right in Kathy Colwitz's drawing, we can see this inclusion of the left out. The mother is full and dark, the child is light and empty, and it all hinges so beautifully on that line of her hands caressing the child's head. It's incredibly clever. And on the left, we've got Deanna Petherbridge's drawing the 14 stages of the Tiber. These are two favourites. On the left, Richard Tuttle's monkey recovery from a darkened room, and on the left, Mirandi. And both perfectly illustrate that the void doesn't exist without the full as both the spaces behind and between are given the same weight as the solid. Uh, three things on this slide when thinking about tone. Pierrette block is, blocks horsehair knotted on nylon wire, Claude's landscape, and Frank Auerbach's portrait of Leon Kossov, all using the light and dark of tone to build space. Uh, this was a project with a class of six-year-olds. We looked at Uccello, St. George and the Dragon in the National Gallery. And I then asked them with complete freedom to design their own dragon. And most of them, the reality of St. George's two-legged, two humped back, curly-tailed dragon was now their reality, uh, as in the drawing on the right. I put in the drawing on the left, the Keith Tyson, uh, thinking about drawing as diagrammatic and, and mapping of ideas. My daughter is dyspraxic and in her undergraduate English literature degree, she would quite often uh, swap from prose in her essays, which she was allowed to do into drawing. And they quite often look like a Keith Tyson. Um, on the left, Leon Kossov, Dalston Junction and the architect Paul Stalin's Den Drawing. This building, this carving, this um, 
the, the line is almost weaving the form on the paper. But I also want students to make the drawing their own in a way that's incredibly sort of just and poetic. On the left is Michael Landley's Creeping Buttercup from his Nourishment series. And on the right is a contemporary Polar Carmen. And I'm just ending with this page of photos, thinking about that parallel of the visual language of drawing as we begin to see the possibilities of drawing everywhere and make sense of our whole, how we interact with, with the world through drawing. Um, and interestingly, the wires of the National Gallery audio studio and uh, the phone wires seem to be about communication. But thank you very much. And thank thanks, you. Chloe, for asking me. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, this is going to be an inspiring afternoon. <laughs> We're going to get drawing after this. Lucy Russell is next. Thanks, Joe. Um, drawing People Together was founded by Lucy Russell in Peckham in 2017, which creates socially engaged drawing events and workshops for everyone. Over to you, Lucy. Hello. Um, I've chosen to begin with this uh, piece of local graffiti as it so joyfully plays with the notion of representation and subjectivity. Hat or spaceship, mirrors, duck or rabbit. I love that it works as a throwaway joke or serious philosophical question. The drawing on a white van also clearly represents drawing outside the gallery. Okay, I'm going to talk about, uh, this is the first time I'm speaking about the project as normally drawing people together, as normally I, it's only discussed through the drawing events and the prompts themselves. Normally I let the drawing do the talking. To paraphrase Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message, the message is the medium. I'm gonna ask you to draw some of your own conclusions, some of your own pencil tips. Um, there'll be an address at the end if you want to send them um, because my relationship to teaching is more engagement or fac facilitation as a catalyst. Um, this sketch was chosen the idea that simple drawings can underline uh, complex content. Playful collaboration of words can, can become an invitation that raises issues in, a ways, in ways that can be interpreted as serious and or fun. Um, whether it's socially engaged sketching or techni technical ability, Art is serious fun. Um, I create sites of specific events for a diverse range of abilities, um, drawn adverts, uh, invite attendees, but also work as visual prompts. Um, basically, thankfully, you can spell something out, but everyone will interpret it differently. Uh, and now, I've, sorry, I did it too fast and now I'm too slow. <laughs> These are how I love seeing hands, hand drawing hands. Um, this is art on my sleeve, a badge making workshop and an exhibition of wearable art. The badges became framed for art that you could wear and a hoodie a temporary gallery until you wore one yourself and became a roving gallery. Um, this is People Make Peckham. It's Drawing its, uh, people together is about bringing diverse range of people together as a temporary community to draw together, as much as it is about the act of drawing. People come together as individuals in a group. The, obviously, oh, Doodle Talks, this drawing invited uh, uh, people to draw speakers, observing what the speakers had to say, as well as what they looked like. People could explore and take home multimodal multi ways of communication, their interpretation of an event that happened. Obviously, COVID has been a hard time for literally drawing people together, but it has been interesting navigating drawing people online. And this workshop with chronically ill people raised some very interesting issues about socially distancing bodies. This problem continues to play with the notions of representation and dissemination. Um, it's actually reworking of an old project to continue working socially, how to work socially, distancing and connecting together. 
I also try and embed the knowledge that drawing is both a verb and a noun, an experience and an image, creating both action and artifact. And then the drawing experience is an embodied act beyond the Cartesian dualism that maybe the last image would suggest. The drawing artifact, artifact contains this experience, whether or not visible, a viewer sees the image and experiences drawing out the content too. Um, in parallel to drawing people together, I run uh, Peckham Life Drawing, and this is a series of prompts that encouraging picturing yourself as a life model, exploring looking good and feeling good, observation, haptic and emotive drawing. My own pre drawing practice focuses on redrawing the body through both technical and pencil drawings and feral pastel sketches in all observation is cool. As with most uh, drawings, I hope this speaks for itself. I, you know, the main thing is don't objectify anybody's body, including your own. Again, maybe I'm happier not speaking about these. And I think, yeah, my aim is really about interpretation. So um, there are a couple more slides. And if you do have some drawings, please do send them in. because your, the conclusions you draw, your pencil tips, are just as valid as anybody else's. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. I want to make feral drawings. What a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> you just inspired, unleashed something here. <laughs> um, next up, thank you very much, is Alison Carlier. Alison's practice centers around a fascination in the symbolic systems of visual and spoken language. She uses drawing, audio, text, and working with others to find ways to circumnavigate the thinking brain and analytic thought. She currently teaches adults and drawings for beginners, life drawing and drawing and mindfulness. Over to you, Alison. Thank you, Clary. Um, so I find I'm always searching for ways to help students bypass the thinking brain when drawing, um, how to truly see and use the senses when drawing from observation, whilst quietening the logical brain and its symbolic systems. So this is Matisse in his studio, very famous image. Um, so I use a variety of techniques with students to help them see and suspend judgment of their work. Um, so it might be extended tools, but blind contour and non-dominant hand drawing to engage this inquisitive right brain. So when teaching drawing for beginners, a sentence that um, we often reference is draw what you see rather than what you think you see. So I'm imagining that Van Gogh really, really was drawing what he actually saw, not, oh, I know what a street looks like, I'm gonna draw that. Um, so there's a difference between drawing what you see and what you think you see. So when teaching drawing and mindfulness um, and beginners are aimed to help students to spend judgment of what they're drawing, quite often they won't have ever drawn um, or have very low esteem about their ability to draw. Um, and these techniques can help create a kind of distance between the drawing and their kind of critical inner voice. Uh, so I remember going to a talk um, a few years ago about what makes a good drawing at Tate um, and this Rembrandt sketch was discussed and it is a really good drawing, it's no doubt, um, but I think when teaching that's not helpful, I think it's more constructive to talk about what's learned through the process of drawing. Um, I like to discuss with students how we process drawing in our heads, so how we take in information visually and kinesthetically and how we might use muscle memory or haptic sensations to gauge pressure uh, when we're working tonally or varying the thickness of line like Hockney here. 
So uh, Heath's spatial blindfold uh, drawings using only touch um, help students to take on a broad view of what observation can mean in the context of drawing whilst taking a detour around analytic thought. So I'd argue that it's almost impossible to use logic if you can't actually see what you're drawing. So encouraging students to start with tone, uh, maybe using the side of their charcoal whilst drawing from observation also helps them relinquish control over the drawing. Um, so seeing the object or subject as less defined by boundaries. So I imagine that um, Kathy Colwitz started with tone here. So um, this is Ray Land, um, who came up with the theory of threshold concepts and troublesome knowledge. Um, and I find this helpful when teaching to remind students that it's normal to feel uncomfortable uh, when you're learning something new. And it's my job to kind of guide them through that feeling. So here's two of Oldenburg's fa fabulous statements from 1961. Um, I am for an art that grows up not knowing it is art at all and art given the chance of having a starting point of zero. I am for an art that comes out of a chimney like black hair and scatters in the sky. So this is my father-in-law jumping into a swimming pool as a young man and he's now 94. <laughs> um, and for me, this image sums up an approach to drawing. So that idea of leaping into the unknown, like when we start a drawing, we don't know how it's gonna go. Um, and I think if we can embrace that and not kick against it, it will help the work to be more open-ended. Uh, Lucy Gunning, um, this image was taken during her residency at the Centre for Drawing. And Michael Ginsberg commented, there may be very few actual drawings in my sense of the word in the show, but the show embodies, embodies an attitude, which is a drawing attitude. And I became completely obsessed with what this drawing attitude could be and its potential for drawing. So, um, However, I'm still fascinated in those symbolic systems I talked about at the beginning um, and finding ways to kind of circumnavigate them. And I love Smithson's drawing, how it crosses over from the visual to written language, effortlessly working through this blur between words and pictures so that the words become the pictures. Um, so Jasper Johns, his work sits between the image and the symbol as well, again, breaking up this rule book of how to process visual information. Um, and again, this notion of really seeing, or truly seeing. So he said, one hopes for something resembling truth, some sense of life, even of grace, to flicker at least in the work. So John Latham's famous sentence, the context is half the work. I think we were just talking about this the other day in a live drawing session, um, just talking about negative space and reminding ourselves about the fact that the figure is not in isolation, that they exist within the context of the environment and everything we ever do does. So uh, Richard Wentworth, um, I think questioning what we see and how we understand is so important when teaching drawing and that everything is subject to change. Um, and so Wentworth is a master of this and Listen Gallery described his work as breaking the conventional systems of classification. There might even be, oh, I'll go to it later. Um, Fiona Banner, so life drawing is one of the backbones of my practice and teaching. And I love to see new ways of representing the figure to stretch both my imagination and those of the, the students. So in Fiona Banner's performance needs series, she describes observations of the female form using handwritten words rather than drawn marks. And Anthony Gormley, he has this expansive take on the figure um, and the space it takes up in the world. Um, and his approach to drawing seems to be focused and yet experimental, which I think is a really good role model. Um, and I love the way these marks are playfully rendered with the ball bearing kind of dipped in acrylic and then they roll across the paper. So I worked with Ackroyd and Harvey on this project, A Lens on Life, and Dan had found the technique by hitting a pencil at diagonals across the paper multiple times. And I just would encourage students to work with each other and to work together because I think you learn such a lot from each other um, and it kind of expands your perceptions of what's possible. So my overall aim is to engage others in an open-ended dialogue on the fluidity of drawing as a practice and to get excited about the potentiality of drawing and explore how this unique subjectivity of drawing can bypass the thinking brain and those pesky symbols I was talking about earlier. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chloe. You. Um, again, super inspiring. Um, Cara, oh. next, Cara Savage um, is an artist who specializes in drawing and she's been teaching for the last two years with young students learning observational drawing on one-to-one -one basis. 
um, as well as adults of all ages and levels of the experience of participating in life drawing sessions. Over to you, Cara. Okay, hi. Um, this title is taken from uh, this book in which Berger, Berger describes how a drawing encompasses time because it records an assemblage of moments. Uh, uh, sorry, starting the video, <laughs> and not a single snapshot view. Um, and this is a useful framework of understanding for students. And it also helps illustrate uh, the fact that drawing process itself is fluid and changing as we spend time seeking to understand and give visual form to our thoughts and observations. Um, this slide is about Nicolardi's book uh, describing the necessary relationship between thought and action, which echoes Bergson's theories in Mind and Matter, where he identifies a moment of brain activity between a stimulus and a response. Um, going on to this, uh, <laughs> leaving ahead to uh, perception and the well-known Rubens vase optical illusion that demonstrates our capacity to generate two visual interpretations from a single image. It enables us to feel the mental switch that happens in order to see both the vase and the two face profiles. Um, uh, these images dem demonstrate how our mind amends or completes what we perceive according to what we already know about a thing. They show how our inbuilt face processing is disrupted when the visual input is viewed from an unexpected angle. And once we are aware that the brain can alter our perception, you can either bypass or embrace the effects when making a drawing. Ava Hess considered her sculptures to be 3D drawings or sketches in space. She wrote, thoughts seen touched in a sketchbook. And I love this union of words describing her experience of knowing an object. Uh, she was a process artist who undertook her thinking through materials and making her works and making. Her works are clearly executed through touch and generate a kind of optical tactility where we can sense the feel of the surface and its manipulation by looking at it. Her approach recalls the Renaissance idea of disegno, in which drawing was understood as a cognitive process through which the artists gave form to their ideas. Beyond the making of the pieces, Hess experimented with placement and presentation, looking at the interplay of objects and the spaces in between them. Now, when teaching, I am to encourage an inquiring experimental approach to drawing and an engagement with a sense of discovery. Um, this is a fun exercise that focuses attention on what we can observe without an, about an object through touch, and it connects the sensory experience with the visual mark making. Uh, it helps a student to really notice what they're noticing and to develop their conception of an object. Um, looking at how we make marks when drawing, these old letters written with a dip pen show varying line weights and individual, individuality of hand. Um, if someone cannot modulate their line at first, then you can try carbon paper with hard or soft tools to show the different tones. Um, and larger scale, they, you can try charcoal and move the whole arm and body when drawing. Um, here's some beautiful examples of drawing with line by Van Gogh and Klimt. Lovely directional marks and more densely drawn areas that move towards tone. Klimt's figures have a simplified outline and he exaggerates shapes using his knowledge of anatomy. Uh, Rodan and Sheila, um, again, deceptively simple use of line and also selective line but underpinned with their understanding of anatomical structure. And they have interpreted what they see and manipulated their vision to create their representation. Um, of course, when teaching life drawing, obviously you can't go up and touch the model. <laughs> and it's useful to have a model skeleton alongside the life model. And it's really helpful to be able to identify landmarks on the surface of the body that describe what the internal structure is. It helps the drawing to be a believable construction. Uh, internal line uh, in a, within a life drawing lesson. You can, uh, these are really useful exercises doing zigzagging and blind contour, um, internal gestural lines and rhythm and curve. It's uh, the blind contour um, introducing synchronicity of eye and hand. Um, from the age of about six or seven, I went to pottery classes. Um, and I, looking at these, I can feel the making of the sculptures and also the drawings in the same way. Uh, they've got beautiful fluidity of line describing the movement um, uh, and the tactile qualities of the making. The, the forms are modelling terms incomplete, but they capture the essential qualities. Um, here we've got Henry Moore drawings uh, with his use of cross contour line to describe volume and form. Um, the exercise on the right was uh, finding the figure using negative, negative space. Um, and then you end up with a flat kind of 2D thing, and then you describe it with a few key contour lines. Um, introducing tone to students, I like to start with white objects uh, and introduce the idea of drawing without lines. So finding the planes um, through either 
lifting off charcoal from a charcoal ground or applying blocks of tone rather than outline. Ooh, this is a slide on uh, drawing the head where I've got a real skull alongside the model. So you can again refer to um, the looking at the um, planes, the sides of the head. You can put your hands over your ears and move your head and feel the, the sides the, um, and the volume. If you get the model to uh, give permission, if you get everybody to help feel the weight of the model's head, they get some concept of the mass that they're drawing. Um, we've gone on to the next slide, which is uh, sculptures, uh, Corradini and um, Milado Rosso. The veiled head is very interesting because somehow um, students often find it easier once the, just, the features are uh, less visible, or less drawn to represent those. Oh, now we're on to um, Jenny Saville um, and Auerbach, which are good examples of uh, composite imagery um, using layering of imagery. So, which you, can be showing um, documenting changes over a period of time or reworking uh, manipulation of the image and presentation. Um, these are some student examples where we use tracing paper and we kept, uh, we moved the model and drew them in different positions and layered up and it helps them to experiment with um, manipulating their final image that they're, they're making decision making and how they present their image. Um, we're at the end of all that all of a sudden. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you, it's wonderful. I like that, the idea of leave what you leave out as much as what you put down, that's like staying with me. So thank you very much. Kelly Schopening, it's actually a recording, but we it will come on in a second, is an American artist based in the UK. In 2016, she was shortlisted for both the Derwent and Joa Drawing Prizes. Um, we will hopefully all play. There is no sound. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That, well, that went right to the end. <laughs> quite what happened there. Um, I can't replay it, but I think we're there. It, you need my sound on. Shall we replay? Try replay it. A perception endures of drawing that understands variations in line and gesture as the signature of an individual. The art historian Michael Newman discusses drawing as both an event and a thing for the way the weight of the hand and materiality of substance are discernible upon the surface. In other words, in viewing drawings, we're confronted by marks on a surface left by an individual using a particular material at a given moment in time, and these factors are important to how work is perceived. Via Selman's help, help push representational drawing into the conceptual realm. By filtering the observational gaze through the camera's lens, the resulting drawing asks the viewer to ponder what exactly it is that they're observing. In the next drawing, the artist Robert Longo wanted to evoke the tradition of epic historical battlefield paintings in both its scale and composition. The image is transformed into something more iconic and more of a confrontation for the viewer, urging them to contemplate their own relationship to the mass shared image far more than the original photograph ever could. Hal Foster's observations of Longo's work also apply to Joy Girard's. How it is not, not only the labor involved in the process of drawing, but the vision that deepens stirring it. Stitch has been widely used as an expanded form of drawing and the process and materiality are intrinsic to the work's meaning. The painstaking process serves to elevate the anonymously made graffiti gesture or can be made more poignant knowing that the artist made the work in bed as he was dying from AIDS. In the work of Radhika Kimji, it is easy to see how stitch influences a creative process that engages with both sides of the paper's surface. Ultimately, there is a front to the drawing, but with the tantalizingly visible stains and textures coming through from the other side. 
The artist Barbara Walker sees the technical and material struggle in making a drawing as analogous to processes of reconciliation with history. The act of erasure is used extensively in her work to suggest a number of dynamics. The aura of the work is left in the memory of the viewer. The artist Catherine Anyango Grunwald in her drawings makes us aware how when we view CCTV footage, the subject is often already dead. Yet here they remain, walking, looping, inhabiting a borderland where the present and history exist in the same landscape. So in the 21st century art school, students are expected to conceptualize their work and this can often mean artistic decision-making is sublimated by the more general discussions of ideas. The current pandemic hasn't helped this, but at the same time looking at this crit, do students get that close anyway to scrutinize the material makeup of a drawing? I think something's emerging in the pandemic, how artists have been restricted online are suddenly more aware of how to show their work on screen. So dispelling this idea of a fixed view image of the drawing to instead demonstrate and record the work to examine the drawing as a spatial time-based experience. Here we can see in Anyango Grunewald's work how the accretion of graphite and scarring of surface can be so evocative in such visceral ways. Since lockdown, I've also started to examine the difference between documenting my work and showing it online. The documentary image, anyway, never quite serves the work very well. The short film, the detail shot, and the recording of the work in progress all help demonstrate how technique, materials, and slow accumulation of marks are integral to the work's meaning. I've recently commissioned alumni from around the world to create short project briefs for new students who will be learning primarily online. This presentation shows the many, many ways they are showing their drawings and enabling us to understand them in more, with more breadth. Where in the classroom or studio crit, students express frustration that not enough of their work gets seen or is adequately scrutinized, films enable the artist to pace and direct the eye up, close, across, and over time at how work is developed. These films also help close the distance between art and life. By revealing materiality and process, one also reveals their surroundings and how much they can influence the why and how a drawing is made. In a film like this one, it's easy to appreciate how ideas are more often things that the world impresses upon the artist. In a student context, in a teaching context, this is really helpful to dispel the notion that ideas must be fully formed at the start in advance of making. It also becomes clear that work is often made through collective engagement with ideas, through being in the world. This film, I could appreciate the collective mark making in this work on a surface moving through public space as an object in search of audiences, the artist asking questions during a You were cut short, Kelly, I'm afraid. <laughs> well. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, that was a shortfall of not doing it live there. We didn't have the, we could maybe try and, and catch that last bit. Oops, we have to stop there, everyone, because we're going to have a break. Drawing projects. <laughs> Okay, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna just take a 10 minute pause. Thank you everyone. That was like a rush of ideas and inspiration. We're gonna have a 10 minute break. If everybody stays, the audience stays with their, stays online with us, that would help. Um, 
just we don't have to to have everyone um leave and come back again um so thank you very much we'll have we'll be um listening to Prilly's presentation um there in rio uh, right now so um we'll have a, a short pause thank you very much Hello, drawing projects. <laughs> the, um, we're almost ready to start again. Um, the slide should just run automatically onto your slide. Brilliant. Thank and you. Lee, thank you. I hope everyone rested their weary eyes from the screen for a minute. <laughs> and really, I'll, I'll introduce you as soon as my slide comes up. Okay, uh, is, is my mic working? Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> uh, so I was just waiting for this, the sign that it's all gonna go time, brilliant. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> really is an artist and art educator, a art educator who works in education at the Museum of Modern Art in Rio and as a teacher at the Parque Lang Visual Art School. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Sorry. <laughs> so over to you. <laughs> it should just start off. Uh, hi. Yeah, I, I think as um, many people here, uh, my work is a hybrid between uh, drawing, being an artist and teaching. And a lot of the times uh, the art I present is actually a collaboration and um, I consider teaching as a studio practice as well. So here's a very personal selection on popcorn. Uh, Aztecs uh, had a really spiritual relationship with popcorn. Uh, they used to put it in their uh, clothes for rituals and um, dancing and Jews and popcorn. So festivity called Purim. Uh, this is sort of a carnival uh, and a very popular snack in this uh, festivity is popcorn and therefore a famous costume for the festivities as well. Um, for African Brazilian uh, religion, candomblé, uh, popcorn is sacred and it's an offering you give to the, um, to the spirits of healing. So the popcorn is seen both as the wound visually and the, the transformation is seen as a process of healing. Uh, the United States kind of took a, a very capitalist turn on popcorn and uh, with the red and white wrapping and the price rising of a very cheap snack. Um, well, you get that kind of aesthetic that we're very used to. So popcorn is a very um, street um, famous snack because it's very easy to make on the move and very light to carry. So very popular in street markets and in these little carts that I really enjoy, especially here in Rio. Not now in the pandemic, but. Okay, so in 2014, I was drawing popcorn. I was sculpting popcorn. I was filming popcorn and Kelly was my teacher. So hi Kelly, thanks for that. Uh, so I was drawing visual uh, digital popcorn and installing them on the streets and in maps. So a six year gap then, and in 2020, I'm working at the museum and I've decided to start um, suggesting home-based workshops for kids to do at home. 
uh, with simple materials. And then I remember that I really like to draw popcorn. Um, that could be a really fun exercise, especially because making popcorn is fun by itself. Uh, you hear the pop, you eat it, you put it with salt. Um, uh, the kids are in the kitchen. So uh, it's a process that begins uh, a lot before than the actual drawing of the popcorn. And after the popcorn is made, you can actually look at each popcorn and see how unique they are. And there's a word in, in Brazil called piruá, which is, uh, you know, the corns that stay in the bottom of the pan um, that don't pop, they're called a piruá. And people who don't change here are called a piruá, which is um, the same. So this is a person who I think really captured uh, the exercise I was proposing. So I took this example. I think these are beautiful popcorns. Um, and you can see that Eva really looked at each popcorn that they were drawing. And I, that's a, a personal favorite. With these, I was a bit frustrated when, when I got them back, because um, I, I was like, the wrapping became uh, a protagonist of the drawing instead of uh, what I thought I was proposing. And then I went to, uh, to Google how to draw popcorn. And I found this really interesting, uh, I could find the drawings on the first page. And then I, it told me a lot about kids today, how they're Googling things besides what you tell them. And also how our collective unconscious is very taken over by that US capitalist change. So I got a few ways to draw popcorn with a friend, um, Vinicius, who is in a project in the museum as well. We're doing with people living in the street situation and he's an artist as well. So I asked him to help me out and we made a few drawings together. So, um, so the first step uh, is to pick the popcorn. So you choose one popcorn, you choose the side, you place it. And then if you don't like it, you can just eat it. So there's not much frustration involved, which I think it's a nice um, way to start. And then, okay, classic exercise. A lot of people have, uh, have said this already, but I think it's a really nice way to draw popcorn because it, once you do the surroundings, whatever is left in the middle is a popcorn. Uh, it doesn't matter the shape. Um, there are no mistakes involved because uh, no one knows which popcorn you drew. There's not a, a, a model popcorn. Uh, another very classic exercise, but I think uh, this one is a very nice uh, paradox between a very abstract drawing and a perfect popcorn. Um, yeah, so any color drawing would do. I use sanding paper and brown, but um, I would think any color would do. This is a personal favorite because it's very quick. So it's just the outlines and the orange blobs that, uh, that was uh, the corn before. And this you can really see quickly the amount of possible shapes you can get uh, from uh, a handful of popcorn. Um, this is uh, something I was doing at Camberwell as well, which is to actually paint the popcorn, which I think it's a very uh, small shift uh, for you to notice that you do not know the, what shape a popcorn has. Uh, and suddenly you lose uh, what scale, you lose reference to whatever that is. So thanks. Uh, if you do send me your popcorn drawing, I will be very happy. Thank you. We've got work to do. You, you, you and Lucy are sending us work to do. It's great. I've never seen, I've never thought of popcorn as so fascinating till now. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Um, Louise Bradley is next, a uh, painter and printmaker based in Newcastle upon Tyne. Alongside her studio practice, she's a freelance educator with 25 years experience, facilitating hundreds of projects and practical sessions for people with varying levels of experience. Thank you, Louise. Okay, thanks, Chloe. Um, yeah, I've, I've started to work with a group online who've never really drawn before. So I have to surprise them. I have to eliminate their anxiety. So I would do a lot of warm ups. So this one, you, you kind of, you can use your eyes around this. It's an ancient five path labyrinth, or maybe seven. Um, so, you know, it's got one path, but you would be drawing this. Another thing based on an advent calendar, um, you, you don't look at the paper. So this is really common kind of blind drawing, but you start at number one and you draw to number two. 
and then to number three, etc. So everyone should end up with the same zigzag drawing. So it's just trying to remove people from realizing what they're doing. Oh, this is a little film. Um, I don't know if, if someone could press play on this. Um, this is just using two pencils um, bound together, a soft pencil and a hard pencil, and it, and it removes the fear. I think there is a lot of fear around drawing this group that I'm working with. Um, these slides go really fast when you're presenting. Um, so this one, you stick the paper under the table. So um, this is sort of inspired by Claude Heath, who does a lot of these kind of automatic drawings. And this is using tracing paper. So really encouraging people to enjoy the material and using a pen, and that was two layers. So technique, people really obsessed with trying to make their drawings look good. So you, you'd kind of try and stop that happening. I just, you know, take them away from it, get them to use the, the non-orthodox hand, um, and and then, you know, they'll just enjoy the process. It's, it's very much about the process. So my presentation is about using online, and you can do brilliant things here, like get rid of the color which really help you see tone. Um, it's it's relearning for me how to get away from arriving at a venue with bags and bags of stuff. And I have to try and simplify that. My, my students will only have, oh, this is another little film. Um, if someone could play it, thank you. Um, enjoy the materials. So this is another thing you can do online, speed up your demos, film them beforehand. This is again, people have been mentioning this, sort of using an eraser to carve out the, the lighter tone. Um, use of line, so these, these images, both using kind of contour line, we've got Jura on the right, and um, oh, I've totally forgot his name. Um, Chris Riddell on the left, of course. Um, really powerful images, both, uh, it was the pillows that, that got me. Um, and then just using what's around you to draw. So this is just the sky. Everyone, you know, hopefully can see a sky um, and you're drawing something that's moving. You're not thinking too much about your marks because you've got to get that information down as quickly as possible because it's changing all the time. Um, here's a lovely Ellsworth Kelly, just very minimal line. It's kind of more than the sum of its parts. Um, just really observing, I think, um, revealing the process of looking, you know, that's what these drawings are. Um, and then you understand what that is that you're looking at. Um, these are some drawings I made and really good prompt from the Royal Draw Drawing School, um, which are time based. And the time of the first one is minutes. And then the next ones are just to do with your attention. So you move on to the next drawing as soon as you kind of your attention goes from whatever it is you're drawing and a classic uh, negative space so I just find it this is essential it's really simple way of looking but it's really really difficult um, because you're just switching your mind um, to drawing something you would never normally look at and these all these exercises are really based at these these beginners um, looking here at composition so we're using paintings to draw from all of these, you know, everyone's looking at the same image, which which can actually be really helpful with instructions. And um, this was trying to work out golden section, golden ratio. Um, more mark making, so really um, getting people into exploring, using their materials, making marks and being inspired by these artists. And um, so a lot of energy going into these drawings here. Um, and also thinking about using the paper, the blankness. Um, charcoal really, although a lot of my students wouldn't even have charcoal, um, just how to use the materials to, to show something um, clearly, you know, using different marks and just practicing, just getting them to practice and to let themselves free a bit. Um, another good thing about using the screen um, you can just put in grids, you know, you can draw on the screen to demonstrate what it is you're trying to show people. Um, so again, composition, you're finding middle lines, you're working out where things are. Um, and, you know, a lot of this is just stuff you couldn't normally do. Uh, and early on, someone showed sort of upside down faces and the, the way you recognise images. And this, by presenting something that is the wrong way up, 
you can just see things as they are rather than a face and a plant. Um, so again, using the screen, you can you can kind of have these little extras. Uh, portrait drawings, uh, again, drawing on the screen. So I'm, sh I'm trying to show foreshortening and perspective here um, by using these little devices, little techniques. So looking at the shape of a triangle on someone's face and that will straight away give you the tilt of the head. Here's another little film. Um, and this would be about drawing sound and movement. So I don't know if, if someone could play this little tiny crow. Um, it's quite weird, but it, you know, it's about trying to draw blackness and movement and sound. And then this is the last slide. And this was just a bit of feedback from a student who had never really drawn before. So, you know, he comes to every session, he believes he has a right to try. And I think that's just what we're all trying to do. Um, he's come across a mystery Hebridean island and it's just, you know, new. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. It's all about giving ourselves permission. I totally get that. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Emma Durham, uh is working, currently working on a PhD at the Universidad de Laguna. Uh, she's finalist for the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize this year, 2020. Um, and thank you very much. I'll leave you to it. <laughs> thank you, Gloria, and hi, everyone. So when we go to art school and we learn how to draw, we are usually learning the traditional way of drawing, which is basically uh, about observing carefully what's in front of you and putting down on paper the right proportions and shadings in order to represent a model. But once you master this technique, you may need a new challenge and you might find explore, uh, exploring uh, unconventional or alternative way of drawing uh, more intellectually exciting. And one of these alternatives is drawing performatively. Drawing performatively means focusing on the act of drawing itself and on the body of the producer rather than on the image being produced. The aim here is not to represent faithfully an external reality, but expressing person, personal uh, thoughts, emotions, or experiences. Therefore, we won't be able for accident, uh, we won't be able for intentional results, but for accidental results. Through a process-oriented uh, drawing practice that focuses on gesture, movement, and physicality, we can find new ways to express ourselves or to find ourselves uh, halfway between drawing and performance. There are many exercises that you can try in order to draw performatively. Most of them involve setting some kind of constraints or game rules that you set for yourself, such as the use of certain materials or bodily limitations. For example, drawing with your feet. You can also try prioritizing other senses over sight. For example, turn off the light and use your touch to navigate the piece of paper in order to draw a figure. You will discover surprising results that you couldn't have discovered if you allow your eyes to, to lead the process. Here's another exercise, this is a video, yeah. Here's another exercise that we can uh, try in order to lead our touch, uh, allow our touch lead the process. Uh, it is based on drawing in pairs. One person draws with his finger on the back of the other, and the second person, who is blindfolded, tries uh, to transfer the drawing to the paper. Another possibility is responding to sound. Uh, try blindfolding yourself and allow your, uh, the surrounding sound to lead your mark making. Some people like responding to music as well. However, if you decide to use your sight, try to do it in a different way. For example, try using a mirror to trick your brain. This may look like a really simple exercise, but it's actually very confusing. It is a real intellectual challenge that facilitates many interesting accidents. And this takes me to the next strategy, which is using an everyday object as an unconventional drawing tool. For example, take a chain, dip it in ink, and throw it against a piece of paper in order to produce marks. Using everyday objects usually produce interesting sounds as well. Or you could try using a metallic object to produce marks on stone paper with no additional drawing materials. We can actually use any kind of paper, but stone paper takes especially well marks from metallic objects. 
For example, in this case, I was using horseshoes, which I conducted like puppets in order to create an accidental drawing. One more exercise that we can try involving objects is, to, is filling balloons with graphite, uh, liquid graphite or ink or any other kind of liquid material and burst them of, on the paper surface. This is another technique that facilitates unpredictable results. And this takes me to the next idea I'm going to talk about, which is allowing the materials to lead the process. For example, if we know that we are going to use graphite powder and we know that its main characteristic is that it's very slippery, we can use it to slide on the paper surface in order to produce marks. You could also try um, to plan a drawing activity that pushes your body to its limits. For example, in this case, I was running between these two columns, making marks on them and repeating this action until I got exhausted and out of breath. Interacting with others is also a very fruitful, fruitful strategy. Try this exercise, drawing in pairs. Place an object in the middle and hold each other's hands. Then with your right hand, try to lead the other person left hand in order to draw the object and allow the, your partner to lead your left hand at the same time. Or you can also try drawing collectively. Arrange a drawing session with a group of people and set a basic game rule. This game rule could be as simple as responding to other, pers to other people, uh, gestures or marks. Or you can play with a set of rules. For example, in this case, participants were asked to walk along the paper drawing circles, stop below the lights and only resume their march when the next participant touched their shoulders. But perhaps my favorite uh, strategy is uh, to place your body at the center of the work. And I'm, I mean this both in the figurative and the literal sense. You can allow your body to lead the process and produce a resulting image that is an indexical trace of your body in motion. For example, your, your body may become a drawing tool handled by others. Or you can try making an ambidextrous drawing to create a symmetric image that is closely related to your height, width, and body flexibility. The good thing about these exercises is that anybody can try them regardless of their age or previous drawing experience. And as you can see, there is an infinite number of possibilities. So I invite you and encourage you to invent your own strategies, to think outside the box, to question what drawing means, and to explore the meeting point between drawing and performance. Thank you very much for having me. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much. Again, there's too much inspiration. We're going to get on and homework, <laughs> fun homework. It's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Marta Cruz is next. She's an educator and researcher in the fields of drawing, domestic space and material culture. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a full time adjunct professor at EZAD College of Art and Design in Portugal. Over to you, Marta. Hello, Marta. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Yeah. Do you want to turn your turn your video on? Okay. Can I go on? Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So thank you, Chloe, and all the organization for this opportunity. We see here in the first image the hands of four famous architects at work, reminding us that drawing is a way of physical, tactile, and corporal way of thinking. Think with your pencil, measure with your hands, used to say my teachers in architecture school. And yet, while teaching drawing, I realized that even if unfolding from human measurements and body since antiquity through Renaissance and the 20th century, this approach leaves important special dimensions at sites. When we are drawing space, we are not only thinking and looking at space, we are inside space, inside the same space we are trying to seize and decipher. 
And that means that for an architect or a special designer, the inhabited space is never, as we see in this Manet painting, a neutral, distant background for the isolated foreground figure, but a very complex interrelation of successive plans where light, shadow, color, and textures are at play together with the observer, the furniture, objects, and material surfaces of the inhabited space. As this is so complex, rich, and dense, I find my students many times confused and trying to analyze each element separately. So to guide my students in the learning of the, and connecting to them to these dimensions of space, I have been experimenting with some small devices built by the students themselves that simulate space, but exclude our own body from it. These are small models put at the eye level in which students observe the interplay of light and color. We start by this first one designed to, for the studying of lights as an alternate instrument to perspective to describe space. I urge students to experiment openings and variations in space by observing the interest of the generated effects on the atmosphere. Students are guided to observe and draw the shape of lights and tonal variations of space. The small scale of the model seems to be useful for them in providing an interactive perception targeted to the shape and value of the air between the elements, walls, ceiling, pavement and objects, rather than lines of perspective. This is a very intuitive perception that tries to put together the elements rather than to reason intellectually about them. This has been giving students the foundation for drawing and describe atmospherical smooth ambiences and deepness of space, which grounds them to the other almost immaterial dimension of space, which is color. Color is a powerful matter in architecture and for future interior designers I teach, its use and comprehension is beyond the impact color has as an emotional dimension. In being so connected to light and so variable with light, color in space seems more seems to be more understandable if deriving from a sensitive atmospherical approach to space rather than to perspective. And here again, the students build a small model assembling different color surfaces in which they place a colored elements, most of the times a fruit with a reflective skin. This is almost an abstract or surreal composition from which students can understand the colors in their interdependency, starting by tonal drawing and in a second stage by studying color interactions. For many of them, experimental co experimenting color perception in different environments seems to be challenging demanding, but then an enjoyable and pleasurable, exciting activity. The resulting drawings have been allowing them to perceive the place, the atmospherical place we find in space. As Swiss architect Peter Zumter says, in his book, Atmospheres, the total phenomenon that we cannot reduce to any of its properties. Place that is more than a location, I quote, being a totality made up of concrete things having a material substance, shape, texture and color.
Thank you. Wow, that's again, learning so much from all these presentations. Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> so many ideas there. Um, we have one last but not least presentation. Uh, I think my slide will come up by Simon Packard, um, who is a drawing coordinator at SG, SGS College based at Stroud campus. And within the past 10 years, he's devised a whole foundation cohort, that's 150 students, an expanded drawing day every Thursday, which runs for 20 weeks of the year. So hopefully we're going to see some images, I think we are, of what that is all about. Over to you, Simon. Are you there? Hello? We, we have a moment. We're just waiting for Simon to join us. OK. And I'm not sure how we're quite going to manage. <laughs> Are you there, Simon? We think Simon is in the audience. Um, so he's just trying to join us as a panelist. Ah, OK. So we can, if everybody can just bear with us for a couple of minutes, we'll, we'll unshare the screen and restart as Simon joins us, or we will just have really enjoyed seeing fantastic images. I want to hear what you've got to say about them. <laughs> Shall I talk you through? <laughs> it looks wild anyway. <laughs> Great. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, brilliant. Sorry about that. I um, I was signed in by my partner's Zoom address, which is a rather odd. Um, can I start? Can we go back? Is that possible, Anita? It looks like it is. Are you able to turn your camera on, Simon? Yeah. Only then I can see what you look like. <laughs> you don't want to look, you don't want to see that today. <laughs> Maybe I don't. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll, I'll send a picture later. Uh, <laughs> um, right. So as long as you can hear me, that's great, because um, it's been fascinating so far. Well, you're the last up. And as soon as um, the the presentation is relaunched, we'll be able to hear yours. It's interesting. A word that was uh, mentioned earlier um, is the word feral. Uh, yeah, it's now, true. Um, yeah. I think I have to say, I think I sort of wanted the students that I teach to go feral. Well, yours, your presentation is going to start any second. So you can you can share with us what that means. I hope I'm the last. I'm going to <laughs> offer something that people are going to be worth waiting for. So and this is the first slide. This is the drawing room at Stroud Campus. I designed and it was built by one of our techs called Jake Pond. It started all pristine. This was back in 2018, September. This is my tutor group. The thought being about like an operating theater, life drawing in the round, really clean. Then everything went feral in November when it was options week. So I decided to paint it black and I instructed them to draw on the walls, literally go back to what you can't or you, know, you weren't allowed to do. And in this group, you've got people who've gone on to do fine art, do doctors, dentists, architects, and they could draw on the floor, on the walls. And this, these two pictures, these panoramic views show one week, which is life-size life drawing, and the next week is costume drama. And the person dancing in that costume was an ex-royal ballerina that we discovered as being a student there, not in art, in something else. So she was coaxed into doing this and uh, local costume shops got involved and it became a theater. It became a sort of place where anything happened. Uh, it soon became apparent that other people in the college wanted to see what was happening in there. So musicians started to come along the corridor when they heard music being played. And then this is a film, if you could play this film. Uh, this is uh, a student called Suki drawing with her point shoes into flower. And to be witness to this, this proximity and so close to somebody doing this with these sort of um, ballerinas uh, gestures 
was amazing. There's a short film on the left there showing how the room looked at its at its sort of dirtiness, its sort of chalkiness. And this is Suki modeling toilet rolls, sort of ideas that I cribbed from the internet. Um, so that the room quickly became patinated by what I call endeavor. And these are two short films of students enacting for others. Uh, these students couldn't draw themselves, but they were being drawn. Um, I, I, I use people like Bill Viola um, to sort of reenact certain things that we'd seen in visits to London and how the students took ownership over the space. This is a textile student using a process that I've sort of invented, which is drawing with boot polish into printing varnish and the surface becomes liquid, it becomes warm, it becomes malleable. And there are some of the garments and it's not drawn on paper, it's drawn on card. Um, this is what's called chloroplast corridor, where the students at the beginning of the day, they say, right, you have a day to make artwork out of irregular shapes based on cells and they plaster the walls with them. It, they, it's like an artery of art. And this is one of the drawing days that I'm looking at in my PhD, the effectiveness of these drawing days. Um, this is a really interesting photograph of students from different departments drawing our life model. He's called Dr. Nigel Dodds and he's been body painted. He's been covered in flour, covered in offal. Um, these are the sort of anticipatory drawing days. Uh, sorry for any vegans in the audience, but this is the most productive drawing day ever. For 10 years we've done this and they make glorious prints, drawings. Um, this is from a local abattoir. We take it back. We don't schedule any slaughtering of animals. And everybody does this from photographers to embroiderers. Um, this is another drawing day called Betweenness where you have screen printed sheets at A1 and the students are asked to do something with them. There's no guide. We have staff, we have a team of staff. So you've got 3D people folding them, crunching them, printing, weaving. Um, this is drawing with blocks of coloured ice on the left there. An idea that I sort of stole from the Royal College, but it's revolutionised chalk drawings because the wetness and the chalk together make a paste and the students love this and particularly on objects like toys, for instance, um, that, that all the toys like this. Uh, these from my children's collection of toys on the left, you've got a Steiner toy and on the right you have a plastic croc boot. So we talk about different qualities of toys, different cultural toys. Uh, we've just finished this project, part of the rotation, which a room scattered with toys and I can add my stories to them. This is work by photographers. Um, they print their images onto A1 sheets of drafting film. We have an A1 printer that we punish for this project and they can change them, they can water them, they can scratch them. Um, I'm not interested in the work previous, I'm interested in what they can do on that day with that process. This is the work by somebody called Robin Watkins Davis who drew with her body on rolled up pieces of perspex and then she literally distressed every photograph she made with cleaning liquids you can find underneath the sink, bleach, sif, everything. She was the drawing tool. Um, these are sketchbooks that I introduced called the big books. These hang in the corridors. We haven't done it this year. Um, so every drawing they make for 20 weeks are in there and everybody can leaf through them. Ofsted thought these were amazing. They said these are the, the spine bones of the department, which I thought was quite a nice quote. Um, now this is a drawing project that I had to devise when I worked at a different campus, not in an art department. This is called drawing to delete. They draw on paper and then they cut out aspects of their drawing and then they illuminate it with their torches on their phones, pull the blinds down. So this is a very specifically bespoke project for a non-environment. Um, the person in the middle, that's a short film, if you could play it. This is one of our life models called Nicoletta. Um, here, she's reliving the, the apparent 96 lives that she's had. She's a wonderful performer, a photographer herself. And this is photography done by students. They do drawing as well. And this is a film here of what the drawing room looked like just before lockdown. You've got musicians, you have uh, life models. And on the right is the brand new start of our drawing room, Mark II, which is a mobile drawing room 
built this is just this week and it's a it's a unit that we can take apart and take away wow how do we get onto that foundation course i want to be <laughs> <laughs> brilliant such ideas everyone it's so generous what you've all contributed to this um i'm buzzing um, it makes me want to draw immediately um absolutely buzzing um i know now we've got some time for questions and uh if people want to um write them into the chat then i then drawing project anita and fiona will be will be um fielding them so fiona is uh the master or mistress of the questions <laughs> um so please feel free to put questions into the chat or possibly even raise a hand because we haven't had many live questions but it's been such a fantastic afternoon of really exciting and different approaches to drawing um everything from learning about popcorn to offal um and an amazing amount of energy um and systematic thinking around teaching pedagogy and approaches to drawing today and it has been truly fantastic so i'm just we're just i'm just talking while we find questions and fiona has some so there's only been one specific question so far which you're was, not you're on am I, can, can you hear me okay if you need to speak yeah yeah, yeah. um we're sitting next to each other we don't want any feedback um for louise bradley somebody very specifically asked what is the who is the painting by of the white window that was in your slide about paint, paint, drawing from painting you know the one turn your turn your unmute yourself louise Sorry, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I will um, I'll have a look and I'll put it in the chat. Look quickly. You could, if you <laughs> pop it back into the chat or into the Q&A, that would be fantastic. Thank you. I've got a quick question that might be cheating, but I wanted to know what was on your last slide, Kelly. Do you remember? <laughs> it, it ended with an excerpt from a film which didn't rely so much on language. It was images and sound, so it was... Um, really atmospheric, which I think is, you know, one of the things thinking about online teaching is that it can favor words so much. That's That was what I was trying to kind of pull out from those presentations where we could get around that problem a little bit. Yeah. It, this, uh, that's great to hear, Kelly, and useful to know um, in terms it informs the approach in a way about something that's coming next in the questions. Um, there's a question from Serena, which is, I've heard a few hours, ideas about alleviating students' anxiety about making a good drawing. And the question, I don't think it's to anyone in particular, is what's been your most effective argument that whatever a student draws is good? Great question. Anybody want to take that? I hear, I hear Simon. <laughs> uh, I think it's as much about uh, the student being involved in the act of drawing and then discovering different materials along the way. Um, I've not had that question myself. I mean, I, I have actually been doing quite a lot of drawing online, but the but the qualities of being being in a place to do it with others, I think that's what's been missing. Um, I would just I would just ask the person to explore the materials as much as they can. You know that I. That's great. I mean, I think the question came, I, I know that there was a, a symposium at UAL about what is a good drawing and obviously the publication, which I think Alison referred to. Um, so I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on that. Alison, is that one for you? Yeah, um, I would say that um, when I was doing my PG cert, that they kept going on and on about giving feedback on the learning and not not on the kind of finished article of the drawing, but what has the person learned? So if you just focus on that and not use terms like good and bad, like this kind of idea of judging, because actually it's, it's so subjective and it's all down to taste a lot of the time, isn't it? So if you're feeding back on the learning, then that's much more constructive and then they go away, oh, okay, next time I will do X, Y, and Z. So I. Uh, yeah, I, I, that was a really great symposium. I really enjoyed it, but I don't think it applies to teaching this good drawing idea. Personally, I don't think it's particularly helpful. So. Thanks, Alison. Uh, Kelly, you want to come in? 
as one of the producers of that event, um, the conclusion that we came to was that it depends what the purpose is of the drawing. I don't think it was about defining what, what a drawing, that a, any particular kind of drawing was good, but if you were gonna make a drawing for a surgeon, you would want it to be really good, you know, for the purpose of making that first cut. And I think that was kind of the point was it depended what, um, you know, what the the intention or who the audience was. So it it kind of defines it in a slightly different way in terms of not, not necessarily about skill, I guess, but purpose. That's great. Thanks, Kelly. I, I also contributed to that. And I think I agree is that it's about a drawing being fit for its function. And that's what makes a good drawing. Um, there was another question that I think um, Nicola Anderson Gibbs asked, Joe Lewis talked about wanting her students' drawings to be just, I'm not sure if that's in the same sort of ballpark, but do, Joe, did you have any, can you expand on what you meant by that? Um, I, was, I was using the French word juste. Um, I, I didn't, I couldn't find an English, I didn't know, it didn't come to my mind immediately, the right word in English to use, but I was, I, I was talking about the students feeling brave enough to, 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 to take ownership of, of the process of drawing and then, and then really make it, make it their own in, in that way that was totally just used to them. That's great. I hope that makes sense. Really, that really clarifies, I think. Um, there's a question next from Jake uh, for Simon, um, which is a very specific question, which is how are you dealing with the current pandemic in the life room or in the drawing room rather? Um, well, we've just <clears throat> finished the, the toy drawing and um, the students have sort of enjoyed that. Um, we're just about to go into the new drawing room. I mean, I've been teaching online nearly every Friday through lockdown with older students devising projects online. So I, I've quite enjoyed that. Um, if I could just go back, if I could, um, <clears throat> about what's a good drawing. During toy, toy drawing, each student did an A1 compressed charcoal drawing but what they didn't know at the end that they were all going to rub it out i know that's we've we've done this before as professionals i'm sure but it sort of eroded away and it it created a sort of demarcation of talent because some people were looking over their shoulders to see oh this person is amazing so by rubbing it all out and starting again there was a sense of well this is more of a fine art language so i don't know whether that helps I mean, it's a brave thing to do, but they all went with it. And actually the work that they made had a bit more of a sort of edge to it, a little bit more of a drive. And as one student said, she said, this is a metaphor. We are rubbing away what we've been taught previously and introduced to a different way of life, which I thought I didn't prompt that. So, um, so yeah, dealing with a pandemic, we're, we're teaching two days out of three. Uh, so that's how we're doing it. I hope that helps. Do you think the question is more to do with handling and contact? Because, I mean, your life, your drawing studio is very busy and very full, lots of material stuff being handled, so I'm not sure. Um, well, they, 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 each student has a, has a box of materials and that they use those materials. Um, there's still been models in. No, there has been distancing involved. There has, there has to be. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. Simon, we've got a couple of questions for you. So sorry, other panellists. Um, and maybe one is one that we can perhaps answer at the end, which is a, to know a bit more about Simon's doctoral study. Okay. Um, very briefly. Uh, very briefly. Well, it's called, it, the title of it uh, at the moment is Ice Awful, Why Ask a Photographer to Draw, Making Without Marking. And it's looking at the effects of students that participated in 20 weeks of drawing days at the college and I'm looking at what, how that's affected their creative lives of uh, lives four years, three years on and the makeup of those days. And one particular factor was that it wasn't really marked. It was marked in a quiet way, a soft way. Um, and apart from one project in the year, which was flesh, which they knew was coming next, they didn't have any idea of the next drawing day theme and they were free to work in any space. And we, a word that I've been writing about at the moment is commandeered. The drawing days and team commandeered the studios on every floor to work in. The print room was negated. It became 
tables full of ice to use. So it, it was a takeover. It was like a, we were like a parasite course at the end of the foundation course on the Thursday. So that's, that's what I'm looking at. And uh, the spaces that they worked in as well. That's it. Okay, thanks, Simon. Really helpful to hear. Um, next quick question. Um, how important is technique rather than process to the participants? Um, or, or participants. Do you want to give someone a bit of space, Simon? No, no, sorry, I, I, was, I, I was speaking as I was thinking. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to take that? That would, that would be a good, um, I'd love to hear M. Lorem talk about that. <laughs> technique and process, that would be. Well, for me personally, I'm much more interested in the process, at least at the moment. Mm, I, I would say technique is not important at all, actually. I try to do every, every drawing I do, I try to do it differently and use a different material or a different surface or a different work in a different context. But I'm much more interested in how my body responds to the through the process of drawing and maybe also to um, how it responds to a particular context or the behavior of the audience or but yeah certainly I'm much more interested in process I can understand that for any other for other artists who are more interested in representative drawing technique would be very important and it used to be for me as well but not at the moment anymore I'm afraid. <laughs> Does, it, does anyone else want to come in on that? I mean, to some extent, everything is about process. Um, anyone got any other thoughts? Yeah, I was thinking that depends on what you're uh, saying is technique and what you're saying is process. I think uh, your process uh, is a technique with the chains. And, and uh, if we could look again at what is technique, I think someone said about children's drawings, uh, that's a technique that we go back to a lot of the times when we're learning how to draw again. So I think it's also about to see what technique is as a word as well. I wonder if some of it's a little bit around the discussion that the, what is a good drawing came out of. It's about the kind of vocabulary that we have for drawing um, and how we apply it. And I think some of those things are, are still there to be teased out. Um, I'm not sure if others feel the same, but I still think there's a, quite a bit of clarification on on some of those, you know, di words that we use as verbiage, um, which actually might mean something else in a different context. So it needs to be context specific within that. I'm not sure if anyone else wanted to come in. We've got quite a few questions coming through and we've only really got about five minutes more of questions before we wrap up. So. It would be good to, if Fiona can ass assist in finding the next one. Um, oh, there's just, there's, anyone can answer this. What's the most extreme drawing material you've used? Both material you have used to draw and to draw with and to draw on. Anyone want to go for that one? Um, yes, I've used fire. Um, 60 foot fire hill drawings <laughs> it's quite extreme and so <laughs> it took a long time to set up and last you know maybe 15 minutes um but incredible experience with you know an audience and um yeah exhilarating like all about the the being there and you know just amazing that's quite extreme the fire so we've got fire i'd um just want to add um, about using a spoken word, um, which uh, just trying to sort of think about how text, I think we talked about it already, but like how words might be sort of analogous to drawing and how might conjure up a drawing in someone's imagination and whether that is drawing and that's sort of um, something I'm personally very interested in, but sort of those boundaries of drawing and whether we kind of slip over the side of that boundary, whether we can pull back from that boundary exploring that uh, with words. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Alison. Anyone else? And then we've got another question. Um, perhaps actually sliding from that question would be the question about M. Lowrum's PhD study too. There's obviously quite a bit of interest in 
um, our doctoral um, people out there in the, on the panel. Well, I am researching about performative drawing because um, actually I want to know, I want to kind of understand better my own practice. So I'm researching concepts such as uh, body, space, trace, mark making, like trying to understand what it is that I'm doing and what it is that other artists that I follow and I like are doing. So, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. I'm sure that was, I mean, it's a brilliant um, topic and actually really brilliant to see. Can I just say, hand it back to Clary in a way because we've got five minutes before we close down and I would like to say what a brilliant set of presentations and what a brilliant idea to have the fast fire, if you like, the energy of different approaches to drawing. There've been lots of fantastic themes running through that and lots of things that challenge it. Um, but really let's hand back to Chloe who, uh, as drawing is free, is also thinking about how we get everybody drawing and how we do that through an educative, informative context. And Chloe, you might want to have a minute or so and then just wrap up from there, which would be great. Well, I just thought maybe returning to when I introduced I when I was given the invitation by drawing projects to do this virtual residency, I just saw it as an opportunity to learn, not least from the drawings that are selected for the prize itself, which I was lucky enough to look at and, and imagine through through teaching. So the, the education pack is that. Um, and as someone who teaches drawing, uh, I saw the opportunity here, and because we are we are stuck with the virtual, we have to we are, we're, we're, we can't have um, uh, physical kind of symposiums at the moment. But it does open up this possibility to hear um, to hear ways that people are teaching drawing and their passion for it in different parts of the world. Um, and I think it's a rare thing to um, have teachers come together and share how they do it and the images that they that they love the way the the, the language that they use um, why they're doing it um, and you know certainly for me who teaches drawing it's been incredibly energizing I'm like <laughs> I am so fired up I'm gonna steal all of your ideas and um, but that's what I suppose drawing is free is that too <laughs> it's uh, that it is it is free um, in the sense, I, 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 the, the title has has different meanings. One, um, I wanted to have a space that was free in terms of monetary exchange, so people didn't have to pay to draw, but also in terms of judgment and critique. Um, so I really, um, for those of us, there have been people here speaking about that too, um, that uh, I love what Louise said at the end, you know, it's, it's often hard to give ourselves permission just to draw and, um, uh, so it's it's hopefully yeah this freedom that we can we can all potentially do it and it, this is very very inspiring for that and we do have prompts and popcorn to draw and uh, you know our bodies and touching our bodies making our bodies do we've got a lot of things to do fire not lots of things we shouldn't do at home actually I was just imagining I was imagining Simon's Simon's online <laughs> classes and it's the parents writing in to say um, maybe <laughs> and and Marta's very because I, I was very very interested in the working drawings element of the prize this year and I loved thinking through those and um, and I have a real interest you know drawing space for me personally as, a, as an artist is a very tricky thing <laughs> it's something I'm working I'm always trying to work on um, and I loved I loved those environments and that that was uh, very inspiring to see as well um, how drawing not just in a fine art context but in design and um, drawing that has function um, in the way that Kelly described as well in terms of um, you know medical students and so drawing and all drawing and teaching in all fields um it would i think we need a round two of this kind of event because i'm sure there's there's a lot more um uh, maybe not straight away though because <laughs> we were doing a lot of work <laughs> i get i get enthusiastic and then i have to realize how much work it is but um but thank you very very much everybody um and I know there's a lot, a lot of interest to um, have a recording of this and it will be a very rich resource for people. Um, thank you. So 
Um, and unfortunately, we can't have a drink together. That's the terrible thing about this. I have to go and have a drink on my own. <laughs> well, my husband. <laughs> no, I'll join you online. <laughs> yeah, I'll join you online. <laughs> yeah. But normally, you can. Normally, people can meet, and that's the that's the downfall. But there we go. Otherwise, we've all been able to connect, which has been amazing. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Can I say a huge thank you to everybody? It's been really fantastic to hear all the presentations. A huge thank you to Chloe for bringing everyone together. And I know we haven't answered quite everything in the questions, but we'll try and follow up with you with answers to that. There are a lot of big thank yous in the uh, questions and answers and in the chat. So I'd like to echo that and just say fantastic. Thanks for spending two hours with us with both Drawing is Free and Residence at Drawing Projects UK. And um, please keep an eye on the programme. Uh, there are more events to roll out. And thank you so much for your generosity in spending that time thinking about teaching drawing. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank Take you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>